Raiders of the Lost Ark was released on June 12, 1981, the love child of Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. At the time, both Hollywood juggernauts were at the very top of their game. Lucas just released Empire Strikes Back, the second film of his culture-defining Star Wars, and Spielberg is at the height of his craft with Jaws and Close Encounters, instant classics under his belt. Raiders would go on to define action-adventure movies, along with Temple of Doom and The Last Crusade. These movies created an archetype of the genre. You see its influence across movie history from The Mummy to National Treasure and across platforms inspiring games like Tomb Raider and Uncharted. It's Spielberg's homage to classic movie serials of the past, but it's Lucas' story and Spielberg's direction, not to mention Ford's undeniable charisma as Indiana Jones that made the film something more, leading to a perfect storm that would produce one of the most beloved trilogies of all time. It was perfect and it had a perfect ending. By the end of The Last Crusade, we see our heroes riding into the sunset. It was intentional and Spielberg wanted it to be the end. But sometimes greed and ambition can get the better of us, especially if the franchise has become one of the most recognizable brands in the world and has the potential to bring in even more money. Enter Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, the movie Spielberg didn't want to make but did anyway because George Lucas wanted Indy with 1950s aliens. George Lucas had this idea for Indiana Jones, and it was basically, hey, let's do aliens. Everyone returned. Spielberg directed the movie. Lucas contributed to the story. Ford, 68 at the time, reprised his role with other alias additions to round out the cast. While it did have a little of that Spielberg flair to it, it was largely a disappointment. It had the same beats, the same look, and yes, it grossed over 700 million in the box office, but at the end of the day, Crystal Skull was sad and old. However, it did have the saving grace of trying to wrap everything up full circle. In the end, the way it started, it had the benefit of being the odd one of the bunch, and I was content to think Crystal Skull was Lucas and Spielberg's way of giving Indy a happy ending. That's until Greed reared its ugly head once again, and George Lucas was basically tricked by Bob Iger into selling Lucasfilm along with every major brand he's created to the devil. I'm sorry, to Disney. Kathleen Kennedy was appointed president of Lucasfilm. I sort of moved that treasure trove of stories and various things to Kathy and, and had complete confidence that she was going to take them and make great movies and she didn't waste time getting to the chopping block. She shut down LucasArts, shut down the extended universe, killed Han Solo, made Mary Poppins in space, then killed Leia, made Luke a coward, then killed him alone on a planet because he got tired, but worst of all, not putting them in a single scene together. After the atrocity that was the sequel trilogy, she managed to make the first Star Wars movie to have actually lost money, Solo, a Star Wars story. She announced and canceled multiple movies with multiple directors from Taika Waititi to Patty Jenkins. She canceled two trilogies, one from Game of Thrones, showrunner, spin-off, and Vice, and another from Rianne Johnson. She did manage to start a Boba Fett rip-off show called The Mandalorian, then eventually f***ed that up with the release of Season 3. She oversaw the complete destruction of legacy characters Boba Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi completing the destruction of one of the most popular brands in the entire world. She even managed to pull a magic disappearing act for Willow, brought back just six months ago, then completely vanished from Disney+. Plus. After more than a decade, they managed to dismantle every single one of their IPs except one, and that's about to change, leaving us with Indiana Jones. But don't worry, Kathleen Kennedy has something special in store for our lovable, fedora-wearing, whip-cracking adventure, a couch to sit on while waiting to die. You stole it. Then you stole it. Then I stole it. It's called capitalism. Think about that. That's just dumb. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, or as I like to call it, Indiana Jones and the Dial Down Destruction, is the fifth film in the franchise, but it's the first film entirely from Disney without the iconic Spielberg flair and Lucas's story treatment. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? and leave it to Disney and Kathleen Kennedy to retread old, tired, uncreative, and most importantly, unprofitable ground by bringing Indy back as an old, broken, feeble shell of a man, just for the sake of passing on the torch and the franchise to a young, insufferable feminist because it's been a whole five seconds since Disney's done that. And of course, the most important part of the film according to Disney and probably the single most telling red flag that instantly told a lot of people this will be a train wreck casting Phoebe Waller-Bridge, an actress who either people don't know or apparently loathe. Major mistakes. And now a final triumph. 
which is called capitalism. A comedian taking blame for Fleabag, a show based on her one-woman stage act and specifically made for a certain kind of audience. You know, the kind of audience that shouts at the audience that likes Indiana Jones. Do I have a massive apple? And if you think Kathleen Kennedy cast her for having qualities that let her lead an Indiana Jones franchise known as the quintessential action-adventure series of films, then you better get your head out of Disney's ass and smell the activism coffee. Because the kind of person that plays an androgynous robot and contributed to James Bond walking in front of a freaking missile is just the kind of person that fits an agenda. And that's exactly the kind that ruins popular franchises like Indiana Jones and Tomb Raider. And for some reason, Disney was so confident with this film, they actually showed it at the Cannes Film Festival a full six weeks before a release. And I can't say I was surprised to hear about the reception this film got recently, which has been reported to be as tepid as toilet water. Indiana Jones 5 and the Dial Down Indie had been given a measly five minute ovation. And you'll have to forgive me, my French is a bit rusty, but I think that's loosely translated as your movie's a giant pile of poop. Reports have even come in that the audience was so bored you can hear the French crowd talking. No doubt Disney sees the absolute disaster in their hands when the shills in the Axis media have completely lost the will to sell their souls and gone after the movie. From IGN, who didn't realize how good we had it with Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. The Dial of Destiny begins with a de-aged Harrison Ford trying to retrieve an artifact from Nazi plunderers in 1945. As we've seen in trailers, this version of Indy is a CG monstrosity akin to Luke's CG Walker in the Mandalorian series, but with a budget higher than a coked out junkie, you'd think they'd have Avatar levels deep fakery, but it turns out it's just fake. And this takes up 25 minutes of the opening sequence. The article continues its opening action scene reads like a typical indie adventure on paper with smooth maneuvers aboard moving vehicles to evade goose-stepping treasure hunting baddies. However, the action presented by director and co-writer James Mangold is immediately missing the visual clarity and rhythm that Steven Spielberg and series editor Michael Kahn brought to each of the first four movies. This is the first film in the franchise that won't have Steven Spielberg's direction and this movie is instead helmed by James Mangold, an excellent director by all accounts, but aside from working for a giant soulless corporation and throwing temper tantrums online against fans, he's made Logan, 310 to Yuma, Ford vs Ferrari, and a lot of other good stuff. Working for Disney seems to bring out the worst in anyone working for them, so much for his new Star Wars movie. And the last time we saw Indy, he was married to Marion with a son that was teased to follow in his own footsteps. But Indy 5 is getting the last Jedi treatment. That is to say he's at rock bottom, probably divorced by his wife and abandoned by his son. But don't worry, someone will come along to save him and grant him one last adventure. This time from BBC, I'm not sure how many fans want to see Indiana Jones as a broken, helpless old man who cowers in the corner while his patronizing goddaughter takes the lead, but that's what we're given, and it's as bleak as it sounds. Now from IndieWire, not only is Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny an almost complete waste of time, it's also a belabored reminder that some relics are better left for they and when they belong. If only any previous entries in this series had taken great pains to point that out. Even Variety piles in. Uh oh. Harry Harrison Ford placed the aging Indy in a sequel that serves up nostalgic hokum minus the thrill. James Mangold's action epic is made in style of Steven Spielberg, but the exhilaration is gone. While Phoebe Waller-Bridge of Fleabag fame makes her saucy, spiky, and duplicitous in a cheeky way, we never feel in our guts that Helena is a chip off the old indie block. So while it feels like the film is setting her up to become the new Indy Jones, I wouldn't bet the farm on that happening. And before I go further, a lot of these mirror facts that fans saw a mile away since they first announced the movie. But currently, Rotten Tomatoes has Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny at 51% and the fun doesn't stop there. This time from Stephen Garrett of The Observer, fun isn't the most accurate way to describe its excessive antics. There's never a dull moment, but all the globe-trotting hullabaloos does verge on exhausting. Another from Nicholas Barber of the BBC, the jokes, the zest, and the exuberance just aren't there. So instead of a joyous send-off of our beloved hero, we get a depressed reminder of how much livelier his past adventures were. And lastly, Robbie Collin from the Daily Telegraph, it ultimately feels like a counterfeit of priceless treasure. The shape and the gleam of it might be superficially convincing, but the shabbier craftsmanship gets all the more glaring the longer you look. And you can kind of sum up everything here to one 
single concept. Disney and Kathleen Kennedy seem to be under a misconception when it comes to the character of Indiana Jones, is that he's Harrison Ford. Hey, but don't get me wrong, I'm a huge Harrison Ford fan. He's a top tier actor and I love most of his work. He's made Indy into what we know and some even think he is Indiana Jones and I accept that, but he's been in the industry for a very long time and currently he's kind of hamstrung by his age. And the thing is, what made the character popular is that he represented an ideal. Just like James Bond, the character has become more than the actor. He's not Sean Connery or Daniel Craig or Pierce Brosnan. It's what these characters represent to the fans that love them. Indiana Jones represents what men, the main fan base, wants to become. He's handsome, he's intelligent, he's a womanizer, he's got cash, he does what he wants, he travels the world, he punches people, and more than anything, he shoots people. And sometimes throws a shish kebab at some people. In part, Crystal Skull not doing as well as it should have is because Indy isn't in his prime anymore and it's all the movie could do that wouldn't permanently injure the elderly Harrison Ford. At this point, I'd be in favor of just rebooting the entire franchise altogether, hire someone to take the mantle, tell another tale from Indiana Jones archives, tell the story of Indiana Jones and the secret of the Sphinx, or maybe Indiana Jones and the Philosopher's Stone. But that's kind of the problem. Disney Lucasfilm under Kathleen Kennedy will never do that. The company that wants you to feel shame for ever liking these stories stories that according to their own specific worldview are problematic. They would never put someone like Indiana Jones at the forefront of any of their franchises ever again. Well, that's current year Hollywood for you. And I just think that um, we created Indiana Jones, but it belongs to the world. And now we're their custodians. And our job really is to serve up a huge helping of not only what Indiana Jones means to older people who grew up with it, but we need to reintroduce the character to those who didn't. But they desperately wanted this movie to succeed. They spared no expense to make that a reality with a jaw-dropping budget that could feed an entire third world country. Even by Hollywood standards, 300 million is a massive budget. But unless you're James Cameron making a movie about a bunch of blue aliens, then you might have a giant stinking poop in your hands. Especially when you start off your movie with a CG cartoon and your replacement is a shoehorned unbearable klutz. This entire thing reminds me of Belloc from Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indy's nemesis and a man claiming to be like him but in truth is on the very opposite end of the spectrum. Like Indy, he's a fellow archaeologist but unlike Indy, Belloc seeks treasures and trinkets for the fame, for the glory and the money. Indy has a certain love for the treasure he looks for, he understands their place in the world, he knows the value of these artifacts which are mere trinkets to outsiders but to the people who love them it's something more. You see Indiana Jones is not just a series of films, for some people, it's an inspiration, an ideal. He's a hero. And like Belloc, Disney just don't get that. They don't get indie and they don't get the fans. To them, these franchises are just products, a thing to profit from and what's worse, a platform to spread their own messages. And ultimately, when they finally get the very thing they desperately want, it blows up in their face. Well, that's it for me guys. Thank you so much for watching. Like and subscribe for more nerdy stuff. I'll see you on the next one.